be a message that they will need to hear. And hopefully they'll listen and be converted. You'll get that in a minute. All right, let's pray for the uh, sick folks and our service today. Dear Father, we just thank you for today. And Lord, we just, with great joy and anticipation, uh, look forward to the things that's going to take place today. And God, you are faithful. And God, your word is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide the soul and the spirit. And God, it is your word that we're going to count on today to do the job uh, that you have designed it to do, uh, to speak to hearts and to change lives. And God, for those that are grieving, we just continue to pray for those dear folks and ask you to meet their needs and encourage them, strengthen them, uh, give them the help that they need during these days. Uh, for those who are battling uh, life uh, diseases, uh, I just pray for them and the journey that they're in, and I just pray, God, that your grace will be sufficient. Uh, for those that are dealing with uh, just the normal stuff, we just pray for them and pray, God, that you would meet their needs uh, as well. Again, we just ask you to meet with us in a special way during our service. And God, may it bring honor and glory to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. 1 John 4, 14 says, The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Let's stand together and sing, There is a Savior. If you will remain standing and sing this song along with us, in Christ alone my hope is found.
I'm gonna live like 
Amen. <laughs> you know, we, we sing about my hope is found in Christ alone. We put our hope in Him and we go through the things of this life and you know, just learning to trust Him in all things is so, so important for all of us. Let's stand and sing now, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's stand and sing that again.
Hey. All right, if you'll find your copy of God's Word, turn to Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. Uh, I'm not going to call the name of the lady, uh, but if I called the name, you would know who uh, I was referring to. She made this statement. The biggest mistake man, not men, but mankind has made is to believe that there's just one way to God. I didn't make a mistake because God's word says there is just one way to God and that's through Jesus Christ, his son. Now, we live in a time and a time where the truth is being set aside and lies are beginning to be believed and people are deceived and some of that deception is even in the church. And there may be some sitting in this congregation today, you've been deceived in thinking that you're all right when you're not all right. The scripture is plain. The verse we'll read, it, it's, it makes it as plain as it could be. There is but one process for a person to go to heaven. You won't see the name Baptist. You won't see the name Methodist. You won't see the name Presbyterian. You won't see the name Catholic. You won't see the name of, of Pentecostals. You won't see any denominational name in the verse. It says there is but one process. Well, preacher, do you believe there's going to be people in heaven that's Methodist or Baptist? or Yes, if they have followed the process. Now, they may not be able to follow their church doctrine, because church doctrine may tell them you got to do this. And I'm not going to pick on Adventists, but they say you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. But there has to something happen before that baptism or that baptism that gets you to heaven. Well, preacher, Baptists believe you ought to be baptized, but yes, at the end of the process, not in before the process. Well, preacher, what is that process? A word that we do not like to hear in the church today, and it is called repentance. Repentance has to take place first. Repent and be converted. There is a process that God has ordained for mankind to be what we call to be saved, to be fit for heaven. It is through repentance and being a changed person. And it is just through that process that the next part of the verse is true that your sins may be blotted out. Now there is no other way for sins to be blotted out of your life other than through repentance and the life change that follows that. <clears throat> now we as Baptists, we believe once you get saved, you're always saved. Now hear me collect correctly, that's going to send a lot of people to hell. I believe it with all my heart. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Once you're converted, you're converted. But you can't just say, I've been saved and it be sufficient. Well, preacher, you've got to have a testimony that you're saved. Yes, but it has to be a genuine process in order for it to be true. If there's not been any repentance, and we're going to talk about these things, if there has not been any repentance... If you have not been converted, then your sins are not going to be blotted out. And if your sins have not been blotted out, then on the day of judgment, you're going to have to face your sins. You can't get any plainer than that. Now, for those dear folks who may watch or listen, listen, there is but one way. I didn't decide the way. God decided the way. The one true God. The Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He's the one that decided this is the way to heaven. I want you to listen. Now, there, as I said, there may even be some here that you've never been, you've never truly repented, and you've never been converted, 
So you're in danger of facing your sins on judgment day. Whether you say, well, preacher, I'm saved. Jesus said, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in. Just because we say things doesn't mean anything. Now, this may ruffle some feathers, but I'd rather ruffle a feather and make sure you get to heaven than to smooth it down and you miss heaven. <clears throat> well, I know little Johnny's saved. He made a profession of faith when he was a teenager. I know Susie, she's saved. She made a profession of casual. Listen, if the process has not done, you are not saved. If there was not a genuine repentance and a conversion, you are not born again. You're not saved. You're not fit for heaven. Well, preacher, what does all that mean? Well, that's what the lesson's about today, about true conversion. All right, let's, I quoted most of the verse, I think. Verse number 19 in Acts chapter number 4. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Dear Father, we just pray that you'll be with us in these few minutes that we have this morning. And I just pray, God, that you'd speak uh, to all of our hearts. That, God, we will truly and honestly consider ourselves to make sure that we have rightly been born again. And God, for those who may be watching from, through other venues or on a DVD or YouTube or wherever it may show up, God, will they please listen with a heart to hear and to understand the truth of your word that they might complete the process. For God, that is the only desire this preacher has. God, you know my heart. I'm not trying to make Baptist out of anybody. I'm not trying to get anybody to change their denominations. That's not, that's not important. What is important is if we have truly done what your word tells us that we must do in order to go to heaven. God, bless your word. Sweet Holy Spirit, take that word and stir the hearts of people that there might be convert, converts as a result of this lesson today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Then, preacher, tell me what is true Bible repentance? Repentance is nothing more than having a change of mind. Your change of mind is not about yourself. It is about God. There has to become a time and a place in your life that you recognize that God is right and you're wrong. You've got to recognize that what God says is true and what you believe may not be true. Now, if true repentance happens, a true change of mind, if true repentance happens, then conversion will follow. Conversion is the turning of the life around. Instead of heading in a direction that leads to destruction, you're now heading in a direction that will lead to heaven or the blessings of God or whatever the terminology is that you like to use. So what the, the verse is instructing us to do is repent and be converted. Have that conversion experience, that change of mind, that change of heart, and that change of direction. Now, before you jump to the conclusion, I'm not saying you can do this on your own. You're going to have to, we'll follow the rest of the story in just a minute. What is then, what is a true converted person? Who can I say, can I say of myself, can I say of you, are you truly converted? A converted person, now listen, this is the, this is the key to all that I'm going to say this morning. If in your own life or in the life of your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, whoever they may be, if they have not turned from darkness to light, if they have not turned away from the power of Satan to the power of God, they are not converted. Amen, preacher. What does that mean? If there hasn't been a change in their life, they haven't been born again. The process is being changed from what you were into what God has ordained for you to be. 
Now listen carefully. I'm going to talk about three things in the, in the lesson or uh, uh, message this morning. We're going to look at the nature of what conversion is. We're going to look at uh, the means of that conversion and the importance of that conversion. Now listen, well, how do, preacher, tell me, how do I know if I've truly been converted? Now listen, these things that I'm saying, are they're not options. This is God's teaching of what it looks like or what it takes in order for a person to be truly converted. If these characteristics are not in your life, in the life of your children, in the life of your neighbors, in the life of your co-workers, whoever you come in contact with, if this does not describe them, they are not converted. Well, preacher, how do you know? Can you tell when it's light and when it's dark? Can you tell whether a banana is green or ripe? Things are obvious. And these will be obvious to us as we look at people and ourselves. Well, preacher, we're not to judge people. No, don't buy into that lie. I'm not to condemn people. But I can judge whether they're converted or not by their life and the things that I'm going to talk about right now. All right, here we go. Number one. If true conversion has taken place, there has been a change of understanding from light to darkness. If true conversion happened, there has a change taken place and they went from darkness to light. Well, preacher, what in the world does that mean? The Bible describes what it looks like to be the natural man. The man that is not born again, the man that's not saved, the man that has nothing to do with God. He has a nature. And that nature lives itself out every minute of every day. Well, preacher, well, it, everybody has that nature. Yes, we did. And that's why salvation, that's why conversion is essential, because that nature has to change. Now, what is the old nature, the old man, the sinful nature, what is that like? And, uh, I'm going to use the word, and don't take it, uh, I don't mean it negatively, it's just a true statement. In order to go from light, uh, from darkness to light, you have to begin to understand things a different way. Now, listen carefully. Before a person is converted, they're ignorant. You see how that word could be offensive. It just means you didn't know or didn't understand. Before that experience, you were ignorant to all things moral about your own soul, about God, and about eternity. You did not understand. Now listen, if you think back to your own conversion experience, you didn't understand all there was to know about God or eternity or any of those things. Listen, that's just the nature of man. Before your conversion, you did not know and did not understand your own true character and traits. Well, preacher, I did. I knew all about me. No, you knew what you knew, but you didn't understand as it relates to Before you become a Christian or get uh, converted, you're ignorant of God's true nature and perfections. You did not understand who and who God was, how moral He was, how holy He was, how, and you could talk about God forever and ever. You did not understand those things. You did not understand the awful place that you were in as it relates to eternity. All unconverted people, that's where they stand. They're ignorant of the truth of God, His Word, and what God has intended to do. Now, I'm not talking down to people, but that's just the truth. Because once you come to the light, guess what happens to all those things? There's a total change. Now you do know God and His character. You know His holiness. You know His, His love and, and grace and all those things. You now know and understand those things where before you didn't. Number two, there's a change in the judgment uh, in our lives from error to truth. 
Before you were converted, you were living a lie and you were believing a lie. Well, preacher, what does that mean? Now, this is how the Bible describes it. The lost man, the unconverted man, calls evil good and good evil. But at conversion, what happens? It turns around. Now, after conversion, you call evil evil and you call good good. <laughs> oh, just listen to people. It's obvious. What people are calling good, and we know because we have been enlightened, knows that that is not good, we know that they're not converted because they wouldn't think that way. And I'm not here to preach on any particular sins, but listen, listen to what they say about what the Bible calls sin. It's an alternate lifestyle. It's a, it, everybody all have the right to do this. And all these kind of foolish statements. It's because they have not been converted and had the change of understanding that comes with conversion. Well, preacher, you're just against all kinds of stuff. Well, I am against all kinds of stuff. But that's not what it's about. It's about being that person that has been changed. Your judgment, your understanding about things changes. And now you call things by the right name. Now you call sin, sin. Now you call iniquity, wrong. Now you call wisdom, or the, uh, the path of uh, uh, wisdom, is now pleasant. All those things in the Bible, it's just a bunch, as one old fellow said one time, it's just for the weak-minded. Listen. It is not for the weak-minded. It's for those who have an understanding because they have been converted to Christ. There's a change in affections from carnality and selfishness to love. Your mind has changed. You no longer hate God. You no longer hate His Word, His ordinances, His people, the, the service, the church, all those things. You no longer hate those things. Listen to people. Listen to what they say about the church. Listen to what they say about God. Listen to what they say about those who put profession of faith as being important in their life. Listen to what they say to them. And if they say things that are contrary, you know that they are not converted. Oh, but preacher, all those those professional basketball players and those baseball players and those politicians, they all can't be wrong. Yes, they can. If they have not been converted, they are wrong. I don't care how many means they're worth. Their opinion is not worth a hill of beans if it's not based on his conversion experience. Oh, preacher. <laughs> but once you're converted, you begin to live by a different measure. Now, instead of hating everybody and everything, you love everybody and everything. And that scepter of love is swilled in through your life, and you love God, you love His people, you love lost people, you love your enemies, you love all the things that God tells you all to love. Why? Because you've been converted. Yeah. <clears throat> We live in a time where it is claimed that some lives are more important than others. That's a lie out of the pit. <laughs> I'm going to be so bold to say this. If the President of the United States and his cabinet, if those in Congress, both the House and the Senate, if they were to become converted, our nation would head in a different direction. Oh, no, preacher, yes. It would go in a different direction because understanding would change. Their attitudes and actions would change. Everything would change. They wouldn't hate each other because they're on the other side of the aisle. They wouldn't hate each other because some's black and some's white or Hispanic or whatever other kind of people are there. It wouldn't matter. Because the truly converted live a different 
way. How do I know if somebody is truly born again? It will be visible. It will be visible to everybody that they are living a different kind of life. That's what it looks like to be converted. It is a complete change of mind and attitude and actions. The things that you used to love to do, you no longer love to do those. The things that you hated about everybody else, you now love because you've been changed. Listen, if that change has not taken place, that conversion has not taken place, you are not going to heaven. I don't care what kind of path you think you're on. I don't care what kind of God you think you're serving. I'm telling you the truth. There is but one way, and that's God's way. And he says you've got, to be, you've got to repent and be converted that your sins can be blotted out. Preacher, you got up on the wrong side of the bed. Well, I didn't mean to. Vicky kicked me out. I'm just speaking. Fourth, there'll be a change of will from rebellion to obedience. Before you were saved, you lived life your way. You did things your way. And after conversion, it was no longer about your way, but it was about his way. All unconverted people are in rebellion against God. Oh, no, we love God. We come to his church. We put money in his offering plate. Lost people can do that. But those who have converted, their will has changed. They no longer desire uh, uh, the things of the world. Now, preacher, teach me the old way. Preacher, show me the old path. Preacher, show me how it was to live and be a Christian in the world. Preacher, tell us about that. That's the attitude of a Christian. But to the lost man, don't show us anyway. We want to do our own thing. <clears throat> well, I, I should, probably shouldn't start this story because I, I can, I'll forget part of it. But there's a song. It's on uh, uh, 106.9. And it's talking about worship. And he talks about things that people think are important. And one of the things... <laughs> He makes, we got a rock star preacher. He don't wake us from our slumber. Now listen, if you've got a rock star preacher, you better find another preacher. Because you need one that's going to stir up your soul towards God, amen. Another phrase says, we want our blessings in our pocket. We want our coffee in the lobby. And we want to worship on the screen. Listen, that's, I can't speak to everybody, but that is what unsaved people want. It is not about God. It's always about them. The truly converted, it doesn't have to be that way because they have a different will about them. Now, I'm not going to re-preach those, but I'm going to remind you of them. If you're truly converted, there's a change of understanding from light to darkness. There'll be a change from judgment to, from error to truth. There'll be a change in affections from carnality and selfishness to love. And there'll be a, a change of the will from rebellion to obedience. Have you experienced that change? If that change has not taken place, according to this scripture, you're not converted. Guess what you need to do? R-E-P-E-N-T. Repent. Have the change. Well, preacher, all I have to do is change my mind, my attitude. No. It's not something you can do on your own. It's something that has to be done for you. Well, preacher, what do you mean? Listen carefully. How does conversion take place? Now, I've told you what conversion is. 
But how does it take place? It takes place by grace and grace alone. For by grace are you saved through faith. Conversion is God's grace at the root or the cause of it. God in his mercy. Now listen. God in his mercy makes it possible for those who are uh, in that lost state of misery and and, uh, 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 their future set and fixed that leads to that awful place that we call hell we'll mention later on in the message. Man, left to his own designs, they have but one destination at the end of their life. It is not to be reborn as a cow or as a bird or somebody else. There is a judgment at the end of this life. God, in his grace, through his mercy, provided the only means through which we can be converted. God, in his infinite wisdom, said, the only way that I can change that person, to change their understanding, to change all the things that we talk, the only way I can change that is through offering a sacrifice that I can accept as sufficient. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And then God could say, I have have redeemed you. Return to me. On Calvary's cross those 2,000 years ago, Jesus declared mankind redeemed. And he did what was necessary for that redemption to take place because of his grace and his mercy alone. Nothing that I could do. I could change all that I wanted to change, but it wouldn't be sufficient. But through Calvary and what Jesus Christ did, God's truth is the vehicle or the means to lead us to that conversion. The Bible tells us the law of the Lord is perfect. The word of God is perfect. The word of God is perfect and converteth the soul. God in his grace pinned down the story in what we call the Bible. And he pinned that truth down that we could come and be converted as a result of that story. Now listen. Well, preacher, why should I believe you that we need to be converted? Why should I believe you that we need to repent? God, in his infinite wisdom, pinned it down. This book tells me, and anybody who's willing to read it, it tells me God's view of mankind. The Bible tells me that I am worthless. At my very best, it is but filthy rags. And I could go through all the scriptures and tell us all those things. But in his infinite wisdom, he put it down in the book. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that does not sin. And God said, I'll make a way because of my grace. And God pinned it down in this book. And he's using this, the foolishness of preaching today to try to get you to understand conversion is essential. What happened the first day that God presented the gospel to mankind? What happened? The first time that a a man of God stood and he spoke the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what happened? People repented and was converted. Matter of fact, it says there's 3,000. In the book of Romans, Paul, he said, how can they hear without a preacher? You remember that? The gospel has to be proclaimed either through a spokesman or through the written word. But it's God's story 
about his love and grace and his offer to sinful man if they just will be believe. The third point, faith is essential. Faith is essential. Obedience to that truth is essential. What this preacher is doing today for those who are unconverted, even in this auditorium or however you're seeing this or hearing it, my job today is to get you to hear, to get you to consider, to put the proper weight or uh, uh, importance upon this message that you will see that you need to be converted. I'm calling upon you, those that are unconverted, I'm calling on you to, to act upon the things that you're hearing. To obey what God is saying into your heart that you need to be born again, you need to be converted, you need to change your direction by putting your faith in the gospel that through my mercy and grace I provide. That is the only way. Oh, you narrow-minded Baptist telling us there's just one way. Listen, God made that way. It wasn't Baptist. It's just what we hold on to. You must repent and you must be converted before your sins can be blotted out. Oh, preacher, that's over my head. Well, I'll take this the right way. Jesus said all you got to have is the faith of a little child. You just have to believe. There's nothing more than simple faith to start the process. Preacher, what is that faith like? It's simply believing the story. The story of the gospel. The story that God wrote in his word from Genesis to Revelation in the gospels, Jesus coming and living and dying and being resurrected and believe that he did that because you needed the change. You needed to be converted. You needed to be born again. And he said, this is the only way. Oh, preacher, it is the only way that God accepts. Now, you may come up with some other devised plan, but it won't be accepted because God accepts only those who come through his way. In reality, there is truly no other way except the way that God has. Question one, have you experienced that change by the means that God has established? Well, preacher, I joined the church. I didn't read that in there anywhere. Preacher, I come to Sunday school. Preacher, I tithe. Preacher, I try to treat my neighbors right. Preacher, I try to do all these wonderful things. I don't see it. All I see is you've got to repent and be converted by the means that God provided. And there is no other. Oh, preacher. Now, if I can stress to you the importance of this decision. Preacher, I'll take my chances. I'm going to take my chances. I'm going to trust in being a church member. I'm going to trust in coming to church. I'm going to trust in treating my neighbors right. I'm going to trust in my benevolence. I'm going to trust in all those things that people tell me is good. Let me stress to you the importance of conversion. Conversion is the only thing that gives dignity to the soul. Otherwise, in God's sight, it's debased. It's vile. It's unacceptable. In that fallen state, you're wretched and miserable, a traitor to God, an outcast from the things of God. The glory of life is departed. The soul is degraded, but with conversion. The soul is given something new and fresh. It now has been elevated. It's dignified, and it raises the condition of all mental and moral stuff in our life. It is no longer against God. It is now for God. Without conversion, you cannot change. Without conversion, you can't change from that debased state 
to the glorified state. There is but one way, and that's through repentance and conversion. Conversion blesses, and without that conversion, life is miserable. Oh, no, preacher, my life's not miserable. I have a party every Friday night. I have a party every weekend. Me and my buds, we do all these wonderful things. Let me ask you a question. When you get done, how much peace do you have? How much joy do you have? How much real joy or true hope that you have? I'll tell you what you're left with. After all the partying and all the things that you think is wonderful and amazing in this life, you're filled with anxiety and remorse and dread. You have nothing to live for or to get up for the next morning other than a paycheck. But with conversion, it changes. With conversion, listen, you have a peace. And Jesus said, it is my peace and it is a peace that passes all understanding. After conversion, you have a joy of the Holy Spirit that nobody can take away. Amen. But without it, without conversion, it is not there. You can work it up. You can shout it up. You can do all kinds of things. But when you walk out the door, you left it here. But only the truly converted has that change. Converted, conversion is identified with pardon. Without that pardon, there's condemnation. Oh, preacher. The good news. There's a way for your sins to be blotted out. There's a way to have forgiveness of your sins. There's a way that you can get rid of that stain that's in your life. Jesus said, if you'll come to me, I'll come to you. Those who have been uh, converted enjoy the remission of sins and the peace of God and the joy of the Lord. But without it, you stand condemned. And in the day of judgment, you will bear all the guilt, all the guilt. but not so for those who've been converted. They stand before God righteous because they trusted in God's plan and in His Savior. Conversion is connected with eternal life. And on the other side of the equation, misery and eternal death. You hear preachers out there, heaven is a prepared place for what? A prepared people. Hell is a prepared place for unprepared people. Heaven is a place of peace and joy and happiness and all those things that we know that heaven is. Hell is the exact opposite of that. Well, totally imagination let's say I could take a lost person and stick them into heaven do you think they'd feel at home well let's put you in the equation now I don't mean this derogatory I can't speak Spanish what if I put you in a room of people who spoke Spanish and you in there by yourself would you enjoy yourself? I wouldn't. Because I wouldn't. They might be talking about me and I didn't know it. I can tell you they weren't going to be talking how good looking he was. They weren't going to be talking about how skinny he was. They're probably talking how, well, I won't say things that we could be talking about. And I don't mean that derogatory. We just don't feel comfortable. If I could stick a person with stage four cancer in the middle of a city where everybody else was in perfect health, do you think they'd feel at home? Do you see the point? 
There's only but one way to feel at home in heaven, and that is to be prepared for it. You are prepared, and you can enjoy all that waits there for you. Well, preacher, as far as I can tell, I've had that conversion experience. I've repented of my sin by faith. I believe God's word, and I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, and I have repented of them, and I'm living the way that I'm supposed to live. And I have seen all the changes that ought to be taking place. I've seen them in my life. Amen. Go for it. Keep on doing what you're doing. Don't turn back. Don't slow down. Keep marching towards that finish line. But if you're here today, or if you're watching, The good news is, you're not bad enough, it won't work. The bad news is, you're not good enough for it not to work. All people need. All people need to repent and be converted in order for their sins to be blotted out. If you've never experienced that change, today, today could be your change day. Well, preacher, what I do? Believe God's Word. Believe that God in His grace and His mercy provided the means through which you could be converted. And with childlike faith, believe the gospel story. I'll take it back a little bit past the gospel. That all men are sinners. They're wicked and vile before God. And without what He does, there is not a chance of heaven. But in His love, mercy, and grace, He provided a way, an avenue for you to come and be with Him in heaven if by faith you'll believe His story and let Him change your life. It's that simple. There's some closer to making that decision than others. Dear friend, if the Spirit of God and His Word is stirring within you that you have never experienced true conversion, Why not today? Why not today? Well, preacher, I'll just put it off to tomorrow. There may not be a tomorrow. If Joel Cannon had not had his conversion experience, last Sunday afternoon would not have turned out too good for him. But I'm glad he was converted through faith. We don't know when that day of death is coming. Now sometimes you do know it's, well we all should know it's coming, we're all going to die. We just don't know when or how. But sometimes people know. And he used Joelies a year ago. They told him, you may have a year. And it was almost a year, or right at a year. Sometimes they can tell you, but they don't help you make the decision. You have to make it for yourself. Let me encourage you. Read, reread, and think about the verse, and think about the message, and make sure that you have repented, that you have been converted, and that your sins are blotted out. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. <clears throat> As in the, the silence of the moment, and hopefully our attention and our attitude on the things that we've heard today. If you're here today, now listen, if you're here today and you've heard this message today, understand it's by God's sovereign will that you did. You're here today to hear this message. It is one to confirm your decision and your faith or to get you to understand you need to do it. 
And if you're here today and you've never repented and been converted through faith, he's asking you today, will you come to me? Will you put your future life, your eternity in my hands through faith? I promise you, based upon God's word, if you come today in repentance, through faith, accepting his gift, he'll save you today. And you can leave as that converted individual. With the changes, that's possible. But it's your decision. Dear Father, we just thank you for today. I pray, God, that you would take these words and stir the hearts of people. Whether they're seated here in our auditorium or whether they're watching or listening some other way, if they're not saved, I pray that they'll re-listen, think about, meditate on these thoughts. And God, that your sweet Holy Spirit will bring, the, bring them to the place of conversion. For God, that is your will. That is your desire. That's why you sent Jesus to die on the cross for sins and for sinners. To offer us that gift, that opportunity to be born again, to be saved, to be converted according to your good pleasure. Thank you for what you're going to do and for the lives that you change. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all